So it's my pleasure to introduce Haroon, a longtime uh, security contributor and thinker on the trends and direction of the security industry. I really look forward to your speech, Haroon. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll go through it really quickly. Start just by saying thanks. Like I've done lots of black hats, but made it to precious few keynotes, so I'm really glad that you guys uh, actually took the time to come down. Um, I've got lots of slides, so I'm going to blitz through them a little bit, um, try to make up uh, for some time, uh, but hopefully it should be fine. Um, really quickly, I'm going to skip the bio bit. Um, Jeff's already covered most of it. The, the one thing that I did want to say is <clears throat> I've got a bit of a background. We spent a long time breaking stuff, breaking applications, breaking networks. Um, then spent a, a fair amount of time trying to actually defend them, um, and more recently uh, putting out products that people can use uh, to help secure themselves. And I think this is interesting just because uh, lots of what I'm going to say today comes from this kind of mixed perspective, um, and it's something that I'm hoping uh, we can take away. So I guess the first question that most of you should have is, what's with the cheesy title? Um, and the answer is fairly simple. Um, Earlier this year at Troopers, I gave a talk called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, and for those of you who haven't recognized it, that was based on a book by Ben Horowitz. Um, and that talk seemed to go down pretty well. People seemed to like it. So being a man of science, I figured number of talks I've given where the title was based on a book, one. Number of talks people actually liked, one. Seemed like a good idea to, to try for a second one. Um, before, before we actually go on, though, one of the questions you probably have to ask is, how much of a problem are we actually talking about? Um, so lots of what I'm going to talk about here is uh, the problem we currently face. And the question that, that you should be asking is, is this even a problem? Um, Dan Gear recently uh, quoted a paper that went out by Chatham House. Um, which officially holds that the level of security in cyberspace is far better than most of us know. Okay? And the paper actually isn't that bad. If you go through it, the main crux of what they're saying is that people keep depicting cybercrime in absolute terms, so 50 attacks per year, 100 attacks per year, 100,000 attacks per year, when they should be taking it as a percentage of internet size. Okay? And as a percentage of internet size, cybercrime doesn't look as bad. Um, so I think it's a valid argument, but I personally uh, agree most with Brian Snow. Okay, and Brian Snow, if you don't recognize him, was the ex-director uh, for information assurance for the NSA, um, who gave a talk titled, Our Cybersecurity Status is Grim and the Way Ahead Will Be Hard, at a conference in Malta. Um, and Brian's point essentially was that your cyber systems continue to function and serve not due to the expertise of your security staff, chiefly just due to the sufferance of your opponents. And that's an uncomfortable thing to hear. Okay? No matter how many times you say it, or no matter how many times you hear it, it always feels uh, slightly uncomfortable. In 2011, um, we wrote a piece uh, that we put out called Our Upcoming Security Apocalypse, okay? which sounds all dramatic. Um, but essentially, what we were saying is that we were building our stacks on a house of cards. And we spoke in the paper about an impending crisis that faced information security. And essentially, we were talking about a crisis of confidence. Okay, we said that we've been around for a while, and we can't use the same excuses we've been using. And at some point, this house of cards is going to come tumbling down, and we're the ones who are going to look weak for it. Um, in the in the original post, I had a simple litmus test, which I think we'll try here. Um, so what I want you guys to do, uh, firstly, with a show of hands, how many of you are here as network defenders, just out of interest, if you can just raise your hands? That's about half. Um, so what I want you guys to figure is, I want you to imagine the highest value individual that you've got at your corporation. Okay, and I'm talking about the guy who's computer and all of the assets that that guy touches, you'd absolutely do anything to protect. And the question then is, how willing are you to say that you could stop a determined attacker from compromising him? Um, with a show of hands? 
Okay, this time the number's easier to count. Um, so, as bad as it sounds, this is pretty commonplace, right? And one of the harsh truths that this kicks up is how ineffectual can we be, right? Your organization these days spends hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on security, and the one guy who matters most, you can't protect. And in most cases, you don't even know when he's popped, okay? That's a pretty dodgy place to be. And it's got all the shades of the global financial crisis, right? Lots of money changing hands, lots of people getting rich. On the surface, lots of checks and balances. But ultimately, nobody's really speaking the truth to power. Nobody's admitting how brittle the whole thing is. And what we were saying is that the problem gets slightly worse because boards are now increasingly involved. Okay, for a long time, we used to say the boards are not involved, the boards don't buy in, but now they are. And they're making the logical assumption that the people they pay have this under control, right? Because they've now given us budgets and they do stuff and they think that we're doing stuff. And they just don't know um, how little of it we've got under control. They don't know that we've got very few answers. And for the most part, all of us are just hoping that the attack doesn't come on our watch. And if we're talking about a crisis of confidence, we're already there, okay? And to steal the famous quote, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, if you talk to the people at Target or the people at OPM or any one of the other major breaches, they're gonna turn around and tell you, yeah, we paid hundreds of millions. Yes, we've got hundreds of people on our security team, but holy smokes, those guys just couldn't stop anything when it mattered. And I think the stuff's absolutely gonna get worse, okay? And um, if you ask why it's gonna get worse, there's a bunch of reasons, but I'm gonna give uh, three really quickly. Um, the first one, Assange and WikiLeaks, okay? Assange is, is fond of quoting, uh, actually what's a Billy Graham quote, when he talks about courage being contagious, okay? And his premise was, as a few people stand up to power, few people leak, more and more people get brave and more people will do it. Now, I don't know if that's true, if that goes all the way, but what I do know is that Assange and WikiLeaks have taught people the value of data. So suddenly, more and more people, a secretary working at a small corporation, a clerk, junior members of staff, have started figuring out that actually, access to email matters. Actually, access to the database matters. And we've not figured out how to lock any of that stuff down yet. All of that stuff's still ripe for the taking. Um, the next big one is Snowden, okay? And I'm not going to question whether what he did was right or what he did was wrong, but one of the things he's done is brought hacking clearly into the mainstream. A whole bunch of people who had no idea what could be done with attacks are suddenly going around with, oh, wow, that's cool. We can totally use that to look at stock prices before the stock, uh, before get a jump on the stock market. Okay, and you're starting to see researchers do stuff like the NSA playset, which is let's duplicate tools that were in the NSA catalog. But if researchers are doing this, you can bet that the stuff's happening in the underground also. And that's gonna start bubbling up um, and we're gonna have to up our game seriously. And the next one uh, that I wanna touch on is complexity. Okay, um, like I said, the troopers talk was almost completely dedicated to uh, complexity and the problems it causes. So I'm gonna skim through it really quickly. For one thing, it's totally not a new realization, right? Um, way back in 99, uh, Schneier wrote a post that said, the networks of the future are going to be more complex and therefore less secure. And he basically says, look, this, the complexity runs away from us. We've got no way to manage this. We've got two options. Either we get used to being insecure, or we find some way to, put, to hit pause. And once we hit pause, we can secure stuff. And I guess all of you know we haven't hit pause. Um, the Linux kernel back in 91 had about 10,000 lines of code. Um, today, it's sitting at about 20 million lines of code. Um, Google Chrome, like Chromium, is almost 20 million lines of code. Okay, um, if you're talking about auditing just the stuff that you're using to browse the internet, the task is getting ridiculous. And everywhere you look, 
there's more and more complexity. Um, the examples up here, really quickly, um, the DVI adapter. Some Mac developers a little while back cut open their DVI adapter that ships with the Macs and finds it's got a system on a chip and two gigs of RAM. Um, Jerome from Sprites Mod essentially ran Linux on a hard drive controller. Okay, so not installing it in the hard drive, on the hard drive controller. Um, Bunny and Zobs at, uh, at 3CO3 essentially showed that these tiny micro SD cards have onboard controllers. Okay, these things cost like between 15 and 30 cents, and they've got onboard controllers that they were able to reflash and hijack. Um, the stuff's ridiculously out of control. Um, Alex Ionescu from CrowdStrike last year or earlier this year figured out that most modern monitors actually have a 150 megahertz processor, x86 processor uh, running in them. How do you fit that in your threat model? Um, if you're trying to stop stuff in your organization, what, does this stuff even feature for you? Um, micro SD cards, monitors, hard drives, um, the stuff's ridiculously out of control. Um, something that popped up uh, just the other day, and I figured I'd, I'd bring it here just because it was interesting. How many of you saw this uh, Java serialization bug that just showed up? Okay, it's, it's particularly interesting. One, because it gives you remote code execution almost trivially. But what's interesting is the bug was announced in January and almost nobody saw it. Like everyone just ignored this bug until this paper came out and said, hey, you guys probably want to check these guys' presentation um, because it's going to be dangerous. Um, the core of it, though, uh, without going into the serialization bug, there's a bug in a third-party library, an Apache library, that ships pretty often with Java. So if you've got a Java installation, chances are you're carrying this library, and chances are this library is vulnerable. How does that fit into your threat model? Okay, and if what you're doing, if you're one of the few people who are magically somehow pulling libraries and automatically patching them um, daily, uh, you bump, bump into what I'm calling the Bob Ippolito problem. Okay, and that's totally a made up word, so made up problem, so you're not gonna see it anywhere else. But it's stolen from a presentation that Rory McCune gave. Um, so Rory McCune gave this presentation at OWASP where he basically looked at a whole bunch of software repositories and how access to them was controlled. And right at the top, what you should see is Python PyPy, okay? So the Python software repository is based, the access to it is based on a username and password. And so if you look at popular repositories, like simple JSON, for example, you'll find that it's been downloaded close to 18 million times, okay? Because simple JSON's in everything. And Bob Ippolito, whoever he is, has a username and password that he uses to update simple JSON. And if any of you are running Django or Pylons or Whiskey or Flask, chances are you're doing work with simple JSON. And chances are the security of your product depends on how safe Bob Ippolito keeps his username and password for simple JSON. Okay, complexity-wise, it's off the charts. Most people don't see it coming. And FX, um, in a paper that they released called Back to Basics, cut to the, to the meat of it, which is security is a composite of a whole bunch of things. And in any composite system, there's no critical gate, everything's a gate, okay? And it kind of kills any hope we had of gate-style security. Um, so essentially what I'm saying is we're in bad shape, it's gonna get much worse. And again, most people don't know this. Um, when, when I put out this, this talk title, um, a few people contacted me, some of them being press, and what was interesting is most of the requests from the press were guys going, hold on, you say this is bad, but it can't be that bad, right? Like, you're saying companies don't have this under control, but most of them do, right? And it's kind of strange to tell them, like, no, actually, we're this massive industry, and no, we don't have this stuff under control. Um, so Alex Stamos gave a talk that I'll refer to a few times. Um, he keynoted at AppSec, and he kind of split the world, or he split the uh, Fortune 500, 
And from them, he said, look, you've got a hundred, oh, sorry for the quality of the slide, uh, that's, that's how it comes off YouTube and there's no slides released. Um, he essentially said, you take the secure 100, and in there you've got people who have a shot at defense. Not invulnerable, they've got a shot at defense. They've got guys who can do incident response, they're not just buying everything they get. And he said, if you look at the Fortune 500, there's about 100 of them, in his words, who can play the game. And he said, as soon as you drop past that first 100, you're looking at um, what he's called the toasted 400, okay? And he's saying those guys, even though they mega companies, multi-billion dollar um, multinationals, he says some of them have like three security guys on staff, okay? And what's interesting to me is I'm willing to bet that those guys don't know that they are the toasted 400, okay? Because of the same problem that I said earlier, which is nobody's saying this out loud. Nobody's saying, yeah, actually, we don't have a shot if we are multinational and our team's this small, if we're not giving it uh, the attention it deserves. And it sucks, and it sucks particularly because we've been telling people to care about security for 30 years, and suddenly people care, and we don't have a lot of answers for them. We don't have a lot of do it this way and you'll be fine. Um, so before coming through, I tweeted the other day asking this question, and the question's a little awkwardly phrased. But essentially I was saying, how many organizations do you guys know where if we broke into them, it wouldn't be 2003? Okay, and almost everyone I know, and lots of them are guys who've been in the business for a long time, managed to come back with, yeah, we know a company like that. Okay, and by definition that means there's a lot of companies not like that. And then you've got to ask yourself, what the hell have we been doing for the past 15, 20 years? If attacks that we could do in 2002 and 2003 still work the same way, what's going on? And most of us got into this industry because we wanted to make a difference. We want to actually, wanted to actually move the needle. And just based on the results, we clearly not. Um, I, I spoke to one of my friends before coming here, um, who's a big shot at NCC, and, and he started telling me, look, that's true, but you're forgetting reason X and reason Y, and right now I'm not interested in the reasons why we're sucking. I just think we need the honesty to say we're sucking, so that we can at least uh, look at a reset or a reboot of some sort. Um, and so one of the arguments that come through is, but at least we're doing something, and doing something's better than nothing. And I don't think so. I think pedaling hard in the wrong direction um, doesn't help. And unless we actually honest about where we are, there's a good chance that we set off in the wrong direction and just pedal like hell. Um, so this brings me to um, about 20 minutes into the talk, uh, how we got to the title. Um, so there's a well-known management consultant called Peter Drucker, and, and he's full of quotable quotes. He should have been on Twitter. Um, he says, if you want something new, you have to stop doing something old, okay? And his, one of his quotes kind of inspires the book by Marshall Goldsmith, where he says, look, we spend a lot of time telling people what to do, but not a lot of time telling people what not to do. And in the management sense, they say that all these things that people shouldn't be doing actually stops them from the things they should be doing. Um, so the Goldsmith book uh, essentially goes through like 20 characteristics that they think people should stop doing. I'm not going to go through them now, except to say some of them still match to us perfectly, telling the world how smart we are, negativity, or let me explain why that won't work, making excuses, passing the buck. But I'm not going to use uh, their book at all. Essentially, it was just a foil. Um, what I want to talk about are security anti-patterns. Okay, um, so anti-patterns, pretty straightforward. Stuff that you're doing because you think it's helping, but it's actually not helping uh, that much and is probably harmful. Um, so I've kind of got them into three buckets where we've taken some wrong turns, developed some bad habits, and are missing some opportunities, and I'll try to skim through them. Um, the first one I'm gonna hit at is penetration testing, and that's because I've done penetration testing for a long time. Um, in 2011, um, we gave a talk at uh, 44Con, essentially titled Penetration Testing Considered Harmful. 
Okay, and considering at the time I just stopped about 13 years of being a pen tester and all my friends were pen testers, it explains why I've got fewer friends. Um, but one of the honest things um, that has to be said about pen testing is we pitched it as a solution to a problem. We now do it routinely, but it doesn't seem to be helping. Okay, and there's a few easy things that you can use to figure this out. Um, so, by far, web browsers have been the easiest path of attack against uh, people on the internet. How many people actually use browser-based attacks in their pen test exercises? Okay, you'll find the number vanishingly small. Um, they don't get used on pen tests because that's not how pen tests are done. And the original thinking with pen tests, with red teaming, was supposed to be that you had a group of guys who perfectly emulated attackers. But increasingly what you'll find is you have ways that attackers attack and ways that pen testers attack. Because all the pen testers are doing is emulating other pen testers. And pen testing um, starts to become almost a classic version of the draining the swamp problem. Okay, and if you haven't heard of the draining the swamp problem, essentially what it is is you have a mission which requires you to drain the swamp. You go to drain the swamp and find that it's full of alligators, so you change your mission to fighting alligators. And after a while, you get really good at it. You start building tools. You've got alligator, fighter, matic, 22,000. And at some point, you forget that you were there to drain the swamp, okay? You get so busy fighting the alligators that that's what you do. And I'm saying, largely, that's what pen testing has become. Um, the talk obviously goes through a lot more, but my warning there for my pen testing friends was that pen testing was on a direct course to become the new AV, okay? And if you, they care about it, it's something they should be considering. And mainly it's because you can have a pen test. You can be perfectly pleased with it. Um, on the pen test, you can be completely owned. And after that whole exercise, you can still be completely ownable. Okay, because pen testing doesn't address that problem. Um, so why are people doing pen tests so much? There's a bunch of reasons. These days it's easy to sell. People know what it is. There's a checkbox that says, have you had a pen test? It feels like we're actually doing something, okay, which is kind of how AV started. It delivers a result. Okay, so at the end of the pen test, people feel happy because they've got something tangible. But I'm not sure that helps and just based on the results, it doesn't look like it is. Um, in terms of going the wrong way, one of the other things that consistently surprise me is people who are so comfortable calculating the risk in an organization. Um, so you talk to uh, traditionally the guys who are in compliance or the guys who spend a lot of their time with spreadsheets, and they'll give you calculations that are solid, like we use ale, and you take uh, expected loss, and you take price of the asset, and you get a calculation. And it completely boggles my mind, because uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, recently, Deloitte lost a whole bunch of their docs. I'm not sure if you guys saw this. Do you see how they lost their docs? Someone who worked for Deloitte took their docs when he left, and then happened to be working for Sony. And when Sony got hacked, those docs leaked out, and all of Sony's uh, salaries were in the wild. How do you figure that worked on, Sony, on Deloitte's calculation of their organizational risk? Um, where do you think that featured? And, and there's a bunch of other places um, where this stuff breaks down. And I think some of it is really important. Um, for you guys who are defending networks, I'm willing to bet, and it's, it's kind of surprising, but I'm willing to bet that your company board has no idea how easy it is for someone to read corporate email. I'm willing to bet that the board has no idea that the lowly paid help desk guy can reset exchange admin's password or reset their password and read their mail. And there's a ton of things like this, right? There's a ton of places where risk is hidden in the organization that the people at the top can't know about because they don't even know that that can be done. And the guys at the bottom have done two strange things. One is we kind of have become blasé about it. So we go, yeah, of course, that's how mail works. You talk to a guy and he's like, yeah, mail is clear text. They should be encrypting it. And you know that's not happening in your organization. 
And so there's a great disconnect between the people who actually know how the stuff can go wrong and the people who tell you this organization will go down if someone reads this person's email. And unless we marry those two, um, we just are uh, pretty much flying blind. And if we're talking about things we shouldn't do, I'll go really quickly. Um, one of the things we've got to stop, it's not major, but it's just irritating as hell. Um, we've got to stop referring to breaches in terms of number of records lost. Okay, for some reason it happens consistently and it just makes no sense. Okay, because if you start calculating breaches based in number of lost records, you're going to have a whole bunch of questions. Um, does the Anthem breach, which lost um, 80 million records, count more than a defense contractor who just lost one thing when the one thing happened to be the plans to a strike fighter? Um, it, it muddies the water and it's, uh, it's silly. And, and if we're going to talk about silly things, it's probably the perfect segue um, for us to talk about big data. Um, because big data has dominated the floor um, at the conferences for the last while. Um, and the answer is simple. We don't know what's going on. More data will fix it. Okay? We're not sure where the bad guys are. More data will fix it. And like someone else was saying that for a really long time, right? Um, it was a pretty common refrain for the collect it all mentality, which was let's just get as much as we can and surely um, we'll be able to connect the dots. And other than the ethics of it all, one of the things that became very clear from the Snowden leaks was no. All that data wasn't helping uh, connect that many dots. All that data was just becoming um, more data. Okay, and if you're talking about uh, silly plans that we've got to back away from, I'll go into two really quickly here. Um, threat intelligence and information sharing. Um, so. Uh, RSA this year, Amit Joran, uh, the CEO, I think, gave uh, an interesting talk as the keynote. And it was a really polished talk. And he started off with how difficult, well, he started off with like fancy audio and fancy video. But he basically said, look, things are not working as they stand. Okay, and he went on to quote Stuxnet and he went on to quote the equation group and said, these things bypass all our traditional security mechanisms. And I thought, well, right on. And he then followed it up straight away with, and therefore we need pervasive, true visibility into our enterprises. It's not a nice to have. It's absolutely what you have to have. And if you don't have true pervasive visibility and all of this deep insight, you're not even playing the security game right. Okay, and again, that should just have you thinking, um, we've seen this before. Um, so he also speaks about threat intelligence, okay? And everyone who speaks about threat intelligence says, look, this is a core requirement because we can tell you what sort of attacks are out there and we can tell you the other groups that are probably going to be targeting uh, your organization. And I want to tell you, I didn't just pick these things because they're easy targets. I picked them because they're perfectly typical of how we make bad decisions buying security stuff. Because on their own, these technologies are not horrible, okay? You can make a perfectly good argument for threat intelligence. You can make a perfectly good in, uh, argument for having full PCAP visibility on your network. And there are organizations where it would make sense for them to get it. But I'm willing to bet that that doesn't apply to about 95% of everyone, okay? Because about 95% of everyone, we've already kind of ascertained, still has 2003's problems, okay? They still haven't gotten past that point. Um, this is not where they need to go. Um, if you take examples up here, take OPM, take Target, take Sony, you think those guys needed threat intelligence? Um, no, what they needed was someone to tell them, segment your network. So the first time you get owned, that ownage doesn't translate to everything getting owned. Um, if you were OPM, you needed to be told, don't outsource management of your databases and servers to foreign nationals, okay? Um, that wasn't about threat intelligence. It wasn't about big data. It was basic housekeeping, okay? And we kind of distract ourselves because we conflate the two things consistently. And so the argument that should come back is, but what's wrong with real-time learning? I mean, we can learn in real time what attackers are doing on other networks, and we can use that intelligence. And my question is, well, 
how about six year learning instead of real time learning? Okay, because I'm willing to bet I can take any big network breach from six years ago and read you like a playbook how that attack went down and then ask you how would your network hold up against this attack? And most of the time there's gonna be a lot of shrugging and looking at feet. Okay, because largely we haven't cracked those things. Okay, um, how did target happen? External party fished, access to the internal network, lateral movement inside till they take what they want. Aramco, how did, how did that happen? There's not a lot of details, but essentially there was one point of ownage. From that point they used internal credentials to spread in the network. From a show of hands, how many of your networks would survive once I had domain admin? We've been doing this for 15, 20 years. Like, we still there? Like, that's a ridiculous place to be. Um, and uh, Parisa from, from Google probably said the smartest thing about RSA. Um, when she said, listen, take the money you were gonna spend on Kit and use it to pay for good engineers and then get them what they want. Okay, and you'll start to see more and more people um, saying this. If we go to the bad looking slide again, um, when Alex distinguished between the top 100 and the bottom 400, he put down three conditions, three things that stop the bottom 400 from climbing up. Those three are secure software engineering, engineering focused incident response, and the ability to create, not buy, solutions that were needed. Um, and one of the questions that come up really quickly is, can't we use consultants? And for a while we tried it, okay, but one of the things you have to be honest about, again, just based on the results, it's not working, and you figure out that you can't outsource your thinking, okay? And one of the problems with consultants, other than the fact that most of them don't have skin in the game, is they lack the understanding of your company's prize jewels, okay? They don't understand how your organization works, its, uh, its idiosyncrasies. Okay, which is all important if you're going to crack this. Um, one of the big things, so you take Mudge's keynote, which he gave in like 1999, okay, and one of the things he comes out and says, he says, listen, you need to understand your prize jewels. You need to know where it matters most for your organization, because if you don't, um, what are you doing? And I've spoken to bunches of organizations where you look at what they're doing and they tell you they're understaffed, and you look at what they're doing and they're patching servers and they, that stuff's taking up almost all their time. And then you say to them, well, what matters most to you? And they say the production line. And you say, okay, what are you doing on the production line? And they say, no, we're not allowed to touch the production line. Okay, again, what are you doing? That's just busy work, right? We've taken a bunch of things and we've give, made it our business to do it, but the stuff doesn't tangibly affect what really matters. Okay, and every good presentation should quote Feynman. Um, and, and Feynman a long time ago spoke about cargo cult science. Okay, and in his example he said, look, South China sees there's these people who during the war saw planes landing. And once the war was over and the plane stopped landing, those guys essentially tried to recreate what they saw. So they had guys with coconuts over their ears for flight controllers and they lit fires for runways and they dutifully did all the stuff, waiting for the planes to land, okay? Except the planes didn't, because they were matching the form of it, but essentially didn't do what mattered. And I'm saying that lots of what we are doing is just cargo cult security. We're going through the motions, we're doing the stuff because it kind of looks right, but it doesn't matter on the ground, okay? And the results are just about the same. Um, it's kind of a bad habit, um, which is uh, our next topic, um, bad habits. Um, so one of the bad habits that I wanna hit really quickly is this one, it's not perfect, let's throw it out. Okay, and all of you uh, should recognize it. Again, it's not a new problem. In that same keynote that Mudge gave, he actually talks about an interaction with Bill Cheswick, Steve Bellavin, and Matt Blaze. Um, and he basically says, these guys didn't like something in the uh, libgmp library. And so they were deciding to not use SSH 
and instead go back to using Telnet. And Maj goes like, don't be like that, okay? He says, you can let those guys be like that because they're academics and they spend their life looking for the silver bullet. But if you're in industry, what you should be doing is taking the best of what you can um, all the time. But I still see this pop up consistently. Um, show of hands, how many of you here are running Emmet in your organization? Yeah, it's about five, maybe. Um, which is sad, okay? Because Emmet's really good. It's really useful, and it stopped lots of people who would have been owned from getting owned. And recently, I spoke to one of our clients, and I said to him, listen, why aren't you guys running Emmet? And they're smart crew, they've got their own reverse engineers, and their local reverse engineer came to school me on how Emmet can be bypassed. Okay, and it's true, Emmet can be bypassed, but the attacks that are hitting those guys every day are not the Emmet bypassing attacks. If they had Emmet, it would cut a whole swath of their attack tree down, okay? The solution doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be uh, acceptable for them. And we spoke about this in our Vegas talk uh, this year, Bring Back the Honey Pots, where you find lots of companies have this strange network utopia. Okay, so um, our talk in Vegas was about bringing honey pots back into the organization, and we've been doing a lot of work with this sort of stuff. And when you talk to companies, you'll find one of the first questions network security guys will ask you is, doesn't that introduce risk to my organization? Like, what happens then? And like, you can give them good answers, like how it's not going to, how you've got an interpreted language, how it's blah, blah, blah. But the honest answer is just, come on, like who are you fooling? Like you've got a box, we both know you've got boxes on your network that haven't been patched since 2008. You've got NT4 boxes sitting somewhere on your network. And what you're worried about is will this introduce flaws onto your network? Those two worlds don't match. Okay, there's a utopia that you live in that just doesn't uh, match reality. And you'll find for the same reason that we often require complex solutions when simple ones will do. Um, we sell a product called Canary, and when people see it, one of the first things they go to is, so now you're gonna big data the hell out of it. Like now you've got sensors everywhere and you can start looking for anomalies. And people are surprised when we tell them no. Like that's really not where we're going with this. Like this is, Dirt simple, it does what it says on the tin and then it does it. Um, because it doesn't need to be that complex. And what we want is something uh, simple that works. And if you talk about the network guys uh, raising questions, you find we've kind of gotten into the habit of being super contrarian about everything. Okay, we've really become the no but guys. And uh, Peter Thiel, who's up there, uh, had an interview recently and someone asked him about being a contrarian, and he said, well look, anyone can be a contrarian. It's being a contrarian and being right that's difficult, okay? And in our case, I think beyond being right, one of the things that being the contrarian no guys is doing is it's effectively making organizations root around us. Um, Rich Smith from Etsy gave a really nice talk uh, a few times this year on how they do security at Etsy. Um, and some of his stuff was genuinely eye-opening, okay? Because you'll notice right at the top, he says what they have to do, one of their big tasks is assisting people to do their crazy ideas, okay? And he goes into several slides where he says what we do is hear people's crazy ideas and then try to enable it. And what you should be seeing is that this requires a different set of skills, right? Because lots of guys came up as being the firewall guys or being the network guys, what you need to be are engineers and solution providers because that's what you need to be doing. Um, Alex Stamos takes it further. Um, he says, listen, you can't be saying to people, oh my God, what are you thinking? He says, what you need to be saying is like, yes, sir, I hear why you would want that. Here's how I think you can do that securely and here's another way we think you can improve your revenue. Okay, because that's what it's got to. And lots of us, have kind of come from this history where security were the guys in the corner, okay, where we could scream RTFM to people and we'd read BOFH in our spare time, okay? And you see it even from how many of us choose to self-identify as researchers, 
okay, which is more of a sit in a corner, do stuff. And security is rapidly becoming social, okay? Because um, like Rich says, if you introduce blocking to the organization, you'll be ignored. And essentially he goes on to say that blocking is lazy, okay? And if you're lazy and blocking, um, people will just knock past you, okay? Essentially he's saying no's are finite resource. And it's a really nice way to put it. Um, as security guys, there's only so many no's you can dish out a year, and the rest of them better be, let me help you make that happen, or else we're just going to be uh, passed. Um, which brings up another thing which is really interesting for those of us who do enterprise sec. You'll often find guys saying, you don't understand, this is the problem, or in this organization, this precludes that. And we keep talking about these obstacles as if they just happen to be there. That's the job. Like, the reason the obstacles are there is the reason you have a job. Your job is to make it secure despite those obstacles. We can't keep waiting for the day those obstacles are gone and then we'll magically secure stuff. We have to find ways to secure stuff despite all of those obstacles. And this use of excuses becomes dangerous because right now we're heading um, for the perfect storm. Things are getting more complex and we've kind of bought ourselves a get out of jail free card. Either the board doesn't listen, or this is complex, or you don't understand the organization, blah, blah, blah. And one of the things um, I can't understand is for people who pride themselves on social engineering, how we can still go around saying peop the management don't get it, or the board don't get it. That's a long term social engineering exercise. Okay, your job is to make them get it. And if you can't make them get it, and, and this is gonna sound slightly harsh, but if, if you a CISO, or if you way up in the org chain and you can't make your board get it, you should change jobs. Because either that board is never gonna get it, or you're never gonna get through, but either way, staying there when you can't convince them, like this, it's kind of a do your stuff or get off the pot. Give someone else a shot. Okay, because it needs to happen. And in truth, most of the time, we just end up being distracted by shiny things. Okay, we start doing stuff and shiny stuff distracts us. Um, I'm going to blitz through um, some of these really quickly. Um, some of these were just distractions that I think we give into way too often. Um, disclosure debates uh, resurface almost every six months like clockwork. Um, kind of brings up the XKCD, someone's wrong on the internet and we've all got to tell them why. Um, what's interesting about the latest round of disclosure debates is roles seem almost perfectly reversed if you've been watching it over a few years. Suddenly everyone hates Google Project Zero and one of the reasons that come down when you dig into it is, man, those guys are arrogant. Okay, and if you go way back, uh, you'll find uh, LF1 wrote an article in Security Focus like in 99 or 2000, and he was talking about the fact that everyone disliked full disclosure because EI were doing it and EI had purple hair. Okay, we've kind of gone the same way in 15 years and not made much progress. Um, what I do want to touch on is our unhealthy obsession on zero day and exploits. Okay, because there's a lot of it. Like as an industry, we fetishize it, we lionize it, and most people will tell you, for those of you who are doing pen testing, you're owning networks without using zero day. Okay, networks are getting compromised without it, but we've so focused on it for so long. And we shouldn't be surprised when that's the first thing um, to get regulated. Um, one of the things that uh, are interesting in terms of zero day, is a question that I asked once before, and again, it's just a reminder of actually how little we've accomplished. So I sent a message out to a whole bunch of my friends, uh, guys who've been pen testing for a long time, guys who are consulting, and I said, take your top customers, assume I've got N zero day. How many zero day would it take me to give you the worst day of your life? Um, and almost perfectly routinely, the answer is one or less than one. Okay, we're not even forcing guys to go to two or three. And this is what? Network segmentation. This is stuff that, forget we should have learned 
20 years ago. This is Salsa and Schroeder stuff, which is ancient. Um, and one of the downsides of zero day and our obsession with it is it's given us a modern version of, um, in the West, they used to have the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Um, these days, we've got a version of that that's like the zero day rule. Like, as long as you produce zero day, you're okay. It doesn't matter if you're doing vile stuff. It doesn't matter if you're doing stuff that endangers people. Um, zero day makes it all okay. And it's something we need to consider. Um, so really quickly, um, security conferences. Once again, this whole thing was just a plot for me to get you to watch some of our old talks. Um, we gave a talk about this uh, called a talk about talks because there's a security conference going on now for almost every day of the year. Okay? And we picked on a lot of things uh, in that talk, lots of things that we think should be done differently. And almost everyone thinks that we're going to hone in on stunt hacking. Okay? But surprisingly, I don't have that much of a problem with stunt hacking. I think it's reasonably okay. For the most part, I have a problem with the fact that we've made it a passive exercise for the audience. Okay? You see entire crowds now go to conferences, go through the motions, maybe at lunchtime take a lock picking exercise or take an exercise on how to be a DJ um, for some reason that's closely tied to security conferences. Um, but ultimately, come out of it with nothing. Okay? And you can still track this, right? You can track it for talks that were super hypey. I've used the example before, but there was a lot of hype a few years back when Joanna Ratkowska said that she would make an undetectable hypervisor VM. Um, show of hands, how many of you remember that incident? Okay, a lot of hands. Who can tell me what was the outcome from that? Could she? Like, this is pretty binary. All that hype went into that talk. We don't know whether the takeaway was, yes, you can build an invisible hypervisor VM, or no, you can't. What did we take from that whole exercise? Charlie Miller gave a talk on exploding Mac batteries. Or oh, that's what the slide said. Who can tell me what was the end result? OK. And again, we've got to ask ourselves, like, what are we doing? It's cool to go to those places. It's cool that those guys are doing the research. What are we taking away from it? Um, Jacob Torrey had a really good post um, on conferences. Um, and essentially, he said he broke stuff down into two types of problems. He said you have chess problems and poker problems. And he said that us as researchers like the chess problems. It's the one where you start with a hypothetical situation, and then you do some technical coolness to get a result. It's mentally challenging. It's what we all want to do. And he says, actually, people are getting burnt in the real world by poker problems, where people are not playing the game, they're playing the man. So there's really simple problems that we consider solved that are really hurting a whole bunch of people. And essentially, what he said is this gap is going to keep growing. Okay? And what it's set to do is make us as researchers irrelevant. Um, and it's something, it, it's sad because we are the ones in a position most to help people. And we don't just do it with conferences, right? We do it with lots of stuff. So show of hands again, how many of you have seen the Mark Dowd airdrop stuff? Now you guys are just wise to this whole show of hands thing. Um, so recently, Mark Dowd announced a bug in iOS, okay, which allowed you to attack a phone using airdrop. Big news, For Forbes article, all of that. Show of hands, how many of you know what Beyond Corp is? Anyone? OK, um, one person. Do you work for Google? <laughs> yes, OK. Um, so Beyond Corp is a Google initiative. And it's actually kind of cool. Um, for those of you who've been around for a while, it's what the Jericho Forum wanted to be. But they're actually doing it which is they've completely de-perimeterized their network. Okay? And they've got some technical ways on how it can be done. And obviously, they Google. But they're phasing this out. This is not a kind of idea. Google will run the entire internal network like it's an external network. Okay? And you can see the possibilities for it, right? 
because right now we can't trust lots of stuff on our network anyway. But what I'm more interested in is the fact that none of us have focused on that, even though that came out in 2014. Okay, that's something that's real and tangibly could help our organizations. But that's the stuff that just disappears. Um, so I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands. Question, how many of us in this room identify as security researchers? Just to add insult to injury, I'm gonna throw in a talk from Alan Kay. Um, if you guys ever get a chance to watch an Alan Kay talk on YouTube, do it. On the one hand, it makes you smarter just by having it play in the background. On the other hand, it really embarrasses you about how little we've accomplished. Um, so he gave a talk called The Power of Simplicity, and he was talking about what they accomplished at Xerox PARC. Um, and he went through it and essentially said, the personal computer, the GUI, WYSIWYG, OOP, laser printer, PostScript, Ethernet, peer-to-peer -peer networking, and about half of the internet. Okay, and what's surprising is he says they did that with 25 researchers. And he says it was with a today cost of $12 million per year. Okay, and like I said, this is literally just to make us feel bad. We've got more than 25 security researchers in this room. We haven't figured out how to secure PHP web applications yet. Okay, and yeah, we need to figure out what's going wrong there. Um, so the last section, really quickly, I think we're missing some key opportunities. Um, one of them is we're in such a bad position that we can relook at almost everything. Like right now, we're so bad, we should be able to try lots of stuff because we can't make it much worse. Um, like we should be able to go completely blue sky. Like maybe patching servers doesn't matter anymore. Like maybe we never have to patch our internal servers. We're not going to be much worse off than we currently are. Um, maybe we don't need passwords. Maybe we need a new way to calculate risk. Maybe we do what Beyond Corp is doing and open your internet or your, inter your internal network to the whole world. It's actually an opportunity. The low bar gives us, uh, gives us some room. Um, the other thing that's interesting is cheap hacks in defense still win. Um, how many of you here have done a pen test where you got domain admin on the network? Okay, I'm guessing whole bunches of you. How many of you here on your company network would know if a new user was added to the domain admin group? Okay, <laughs> we've got a few lone hands. This is a super simple thing, right? This doesn't need anything massive. It's two lines of PowerShell that you don't even need domain admin to run. And it would tell you when a new user became domain admin. It would have uncovered uh, the Ramco hack. It might have uh, helped with Sony. Um, the stuff is super simple, and there's lots of little things like this that can be done. You go through your OWA logs, and you can see pretty quickly when badness is happening. You can see, you can write a Python script that'll tell you Bob is logging in from two locations at the same time, okay, and you know you've got a problem. Bob's logging in from multiple countries in the same day, and you know you've got a problem. But it's stuff that we just uh, aren't doing. Um, so really quickly, Alex Stamos says what we need to be doing is building tools. He makes it very clear, he's, well, this was when he was at Yahoo, he's since moved. He says that most box software that they can get doesn't work for them. And I'm saying this isn't just them. They th he thought it was because of Yahoo's scale. And I'm saying the reason is more than that. It's because generic software security solutions almost never work. And what you need to be doing is customizing or building tools for your own organization. And the good thing is nobody currently owns this thing. There's space in here to do coolness. Um, there's space to build stuff. But in terms of building stuff, building stuff is hard. It's hard to go from the tiny script that you've written to an actual product. But I think there's a harder problem that we as security consultants face. And that's the fact that it's hard to go from being always right consultants to building stuff that then gets judged. Okay, because when you're a consultant, you walk in and you're just about always right. Anything that the guy says, you've got a good answer for. 
And when you've got a product, the guy gets to tell you that the button is blue and he really prefers it red. But we can't do any worse than it currently is. And we can't keep complaining that vendors suck unless we're willing to throw a hat in the ring and give it a try ourselves. Um, so really quickly, in summary, um, in summary, that slide seems wrong. We had an important inflection point, okay? There's big trouble on the horizon and increasingly people don't trust us. We simultaneously face a crisis of relevance and a crisis of confidence, okay? Not sure how we managed to pull that off. Um, our current trajectory leads us straight to disaster. If we do nothing to change this, um, it's gonna end up in fail. Um, step one is just to acknowledge this, okay? I think at some point we've just gotta say, okay, right now we're in a horrible position and we need to do stuff uh, to fix it. If you're a defender, um, my advice or my one takeaway would be, make sure that the stuff that you're aiming at matters. If there's one thing that I've seen from most organizations uh, doing defense wrong, it's that lots of them are spending lots of time with busy work uh, that doesn't matter. Um, Dan Gear says it really nicely when he says, you should be asking yourself if what you're doing makes therapeutic different to the, patients, uh, to the patient. Okay, and lots of what we're doing, I think, isn't. If you're an attacker, um, you should realize that there's a bunch of interesting stuff to do on the defensive side. Um, attack is old, um, join the other side, there's coolness there. Um, if you're a researcher, I wanna be very clear, I'm not slating offensive research, um, it's totally important. But one of the things we need to figure out is what we do has repercussions. Okay, and increasingly these days, you're starting to see some of the geopolitical repercussions of the stuff we work on. Uh, Marcus Ranum has a nice slide where he says, friends don't let friends build prism. Okay, and it's, it's something for us to consider. Um, if you're a researcher, we need you to show up and choose a side, um, essentially to throw your hat in the ring. Um, because, yeah, right now we need it pretty desperately. Um, and that's all I've got. Um, I'm told there's no time for questions, but I'll be around afterwards and you can uh, spam me at harunetthings.com or um, tweet at me to tell me why I'm stupid um, and I'll try to respond. Thank you guys.